This is my Bible. It is the living word of God. My mind is renewed and my spirit is prepared to receive the word which produces faith. And faith pleases God. I'm not just a... This word... Shout it out. Take a five-second praise break for the fact that you're in your promised land already. Just, you may not know why I shout like I do. I shout like this because I'm in my promised land. You may not know why I dance like I do during worship. I dance like this because I'm in my promised land. I, I, I'm not on my way there. I'm here. Look at your neighbor say, I'm there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to go to three places today as you remain standing with the Hebrews chapter 10. Flip the Hebrews chapter 10. I told you between uh, a few weeks ago and the end of the year, we're going to be building your faith. Say, faith rise, faith rise in me. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. I'm going to have you so full of faith that fear's got to go. I'm going to have you so full of faith that doubt's got to go. I said, you're going to be so full of faith that unbelief has got to go. Somebody say hallelujah. Hebrews 10, verse 38. When you have it, say, I have it. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just, now that's you and I, we've been made righteous as a free gift. You're not going to do enough to earn righteousness. There's, there's not enough prayers you can pray to get it. Hail Mary, hail Martha, hail uh, whatever. Ain't none of that going to get you righteous. You're given righteousness by Jesus Christ when you become a Christian as a free gift. Look at your neighbor and say, you're righteous. And you're just. Okay, so then now the just, who are we talking about? Us shall live how? By the economy. By what? By government bailouts. By Obama. By Bush. By our jobs. By our spouses. No, by faith. But if any man draw back or stop walking in faith, my soul shall not have any pleasure in him. Look at the neighbor and say, I don't want that part. I don't know. Well, go to Joshua 14. Joshua 14. We're going to look at two people today, two stories of faith. We're going to look at how many people? How many stories of faith? Oh, Jesus. Two and two. Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. This is an awesome passage of scripture because in Joshua we find that Joshua now has taken up the mantle of leadership as his leader his father his mentor Moses is now dead and God comes and speaks to Joshua and says Joshua Moses is dead and now I need you to take the people to another place that Moses was not able to take them to See, some of you are the Joshua's in your bloodline. There's some stuff God couldn't do with the generation before you. There's some stuff that your mother never saw that you're supposed to see. There's some stuff that your father never saw that you're supposed to see. You're the curse breaker in your bloodline. So don't think it's strange when God starts introducing you to different things and start exposing you to different things because God says, I need you to be the Joshua in your generation. So Joshua chapter 14, there were two men, Joshua and Caleb, when they went to spy the promised land. And uh, these two men had a different spirit. Say different spirit. Now look at verse 7. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from uh, Kadesh Barna to espy out the land. And I brought him word again, and it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed my God. There were some folk that started out with you that haven't made it this far with you. There's some folk that you got saved with that ain't still walking with you. There's some folk that in your family that were serving the Lord that ain't walking with you. Caleb said, listen, I, 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 I went far, but there's some people that didn't make it this far on the journey with me. Verse 9, and Moses swore on that day, saying, surely the land where our feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou wholly follow the Lord your God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, and said, These forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. In, in, in essence, what he's saying is, is that God has not kept me alive out of all the stuff that should have killed me for me to die without seeing the promise. 
God has not spared you from the stuff he spared you from and saved you from the stuff he saved you from if he didn't have intentions on you seeing everything he's ordained for your life. Which means if you still got breath in your body, it is not too late. High five somebody. I know you got your Bible in your hand, but high five somebody say it's never too late. Never too late. Verse 11, and yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. Maybe you don't understand the fact that he's 85. I'm talking to somebody. Maybe you don't understand the fact that he's been waiting for over 40 years to see what it was that God had promised him. But he said, I'm as strong today as I was when I got the promise back then. Had to go through some stuff, had to endure some stuff, but I'm still strong today. Ah. As my strength was then, even so my strength is now for war, both to go out and to come in. Verse 12, now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest him the city, and thy kin was there, and the cities were great and fenced. If so, the Lord be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out. As the Lord said, and Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh Hebron for an inheritance. I need you to see something real clear there. He waited for over 40 years. This man's 85. And he's saying, listen, I didn't have to go through a lot of stuff, but I will not be denied. I may make peanut butter and pickle sandwiches sometimes, but I will not be denied. I may have to sleep in my car a few nights, but I will not be denied. I might get laid off a few jobs, but I will not be be denied. I may have people walk out on me, but I will not be denied. Two stories. Two stories. Two sets of faith. Go to Luke 8. This is the last one. Real quick. Luke 8. You know, normally you don't read this much up front. I want you to see these two different people's stories. Because some of you will find yourselves right there in the middle of their stories. Maybe you're Caleb who says, I've been waiting a long time, but I will not be denied. I'm as strong today as I was back then. Matter of fact, I got more wisdom now, so I'm actually stronger now than I was back then. Luke chapter 8, verse 43. This is a familiar passage of scripture, but I want you to see something. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, she spent all her livelihood on what she thought could fix it. Your Bible calls them physicians, but some people spell it drugs. Some folks spell it relationships. Some folks spell it alcohol. Some folks spell it this and that and the other. But she spent all her livelihood, but none of them folks could ever seem to get her right. Anybody ever been there where you said, I tried a lot of other stuff to get right, but none of that stuff seemed to work? Verse 44, came, and she came from behind and touched the hem or the border of his garment. And immediately, somebody shout immediately. I said shout it, not say it loud. Her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? But all denied, Peter and those that were with him said, Master, the multitude strong and press you. And you say, who touched me? In essence, they're saying, this is a stupid question, God. There's a lot of people around you. But Jesus said, no, you don't understand it. Somebody didn't touch me. They touched me. Because when they touched me, I perceived that they pulled some power out of me. Verse 47, now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed. When? Immediately. And he says to her, daughter, be of good cheer. I made you whole. No, that's not what it said. My compassion made you whole. Somebody says, uh, my mercy made you whole. That's not what it says. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Father, you hear me. You always hear me. And in this moment, I pray that you would customize, tailor, make this word for the sound and the ears and the spirits of everybody under the sound of my voice. And I declare by the, by the time I'm done with this, God, that their faith will have risen to such a level that when they walk out of here, everything that was impossible shall be possible. 
It wasn't your compassion. It wasn't your mercy. It wasn't your grace. It wasn't your kindness that fixed her. It was her faith that fixed her. I feel faith rising in this atmosphere. I said, I feel faith rising in this atmosphere. I said, I feel faith rising. And it is so in Jesus' name. High five two or three people as you take your seats and say, audacious faith, audacious faith. Give me some volume in the monitors, audacious faith. Uh, there are two stories today of two people with audacious faith. Now, the scripture says that faith is the what? Substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, which means faith is not a feeling in my heart. Uh, faith is not a feeling. I don't feel faith. Faith is not an experience that happens in church. Faith is very simply, it's what you do with what you know. Faith equals substance. Substance means it can be seen, which means your faith is audacious actions, not merely good thoughts. I'm going to say it again. Faith is more than just good thoughts. It, it is not that. Faith is audacious actions. Faith is substance. I can't see your thoughts. I can only see what you do. Are you still here? Uh, now watch this. W watch this. Watch this. God has given you the measure of faith equal to everybody else. Romans 12, 3. I've been here the last several Sundays. Write it down. Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has dealt to each man the measure of faith. Say, I already have faith, but I must use it for it to grow bigger. Okay, so watch this. Even if you say, Bishop, I'm the most pessimistic, doubting person you'll ever meet, I'm here to tell you even you have faith. You just have faith in the negative. Because the Bible says everybody in here has been given the measure of faith. Now, the question then becomes, Bishop, is how much faith have we been given? I'm going to review this real quick. The initial measure of faith you're given is what? Mustard seeds. Got it? Now, remember, we, we talked about mustard seeds. Our mustard seeds are very small. I think it was one millimeter to two millimeters in diameter. They were very small. But yet these mustard seeds, even though they were very small initially, they would grow and produce great harvest. Matter of fact, Luke chapter 13 says this, and he said, we're unto you, we shall liken the kingdom of God. And he says, it's like a grain of mustard seed. When it's sown in the earth, it's less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all of the other herbs and trees and suited out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Which means your faith may start real, real small. But it will produce incredible things for you. Matter of fact, when you're using your faith, you will say, how did this turn into that? How, how is it I started on this job, but yet I managed to get promoted up to this place? How is it that I started my business with nothing but two nickels, but now I've got all of this to show? How is it that we've been through all of this hell and high water and tribulation, and now I've got all of this show? Faith says, how did this turn into that? So you have faith. Say, I have faith. Now, now watch this. Say, my faith will produce the impossible. Now, here's the thing about impossible. You and your neighbor, we're both on the same date, but I need to tell you something. We are not both in the same day. That's why Jesus prayed, give us this day our daily bread. In essence, what he was saying is, is that while you and your neighbor may be sharing the date, uh, December the 5th, 2010, you are not in the same day in your walk with God. Are you still here? Now, what that means is this, is that what may look like something impossible to you, your neighbor may look at it and say, that ain't nothing. What's the difference? Their faith has matured, and they have graduated to a place to where they look at that situation and say, child, I was there. I've been through that. I, that ain't nothing. You sitting up here crying over that. You're tripping over that. That ain't nothing. I know that's not good English, but I found somebody and say, that ain't nothing. Same date, different day, which means this, which means that what looks impossible for one may not be impossible for another. So don't go around trying to compare yourself to super saint because what's facing you may look impossible and that's where you're at and you just need to deal with where you're at. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Say my faith produces the impossible. Now watch this. Now, now, now watch this. Let's take it another further. The scripture says God is the author and the finisher of our faith. 
Matter of fact, Hebrews 12 and 2, write it down, says, Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, 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 what, what does this mean? He's the author. As the author, God will show you a vision of your life and what it can be. And challenge you to use your faith to see it come to pass. God will have you having dreams in the middle of the night about what your life can be and about what you can accomplish. And you'll look back and say, I want that. I want to see that manifest in my life. That's why the scripture says he gives you the desires of your heart. Here's what he doesn't tell you. I put the desires there in the first place. So he's the author of an incredible story called your life. And he says, I started off, and I'm going to give you a vision of what it can be. That's the finisher. But he says, now, how the story goes in between, that's up to you. Touch your neighbor and say, what's your story? Look, look at the other one next to you say, what's your story? You are the leading character in a brand new novel called Your Life. And this novel's a thick one because this novel's got a lot of twists and turns and peaks and valleys. I'm not talking to anybody in peaks and valleys. It's got betrayal in it. It's got a little deception in it. It's got a little bit of everything. Some of y'all lives have been like soap operas. It's been drama every single day. Am I talking to anybody? Some of you have more elaborate stories. Yours was not uh, simply a daytime thing. You had something like Dallas. Maybe your story was like dynasty. Aaron Spelling is sitting in the back room of your lives writing stuff. You are the leading character in a story, a novel called your life. God writes the beginning and the end, but you have input on everything in between. That's why when someone, when someone passes away, when someone passes away, what, what do we see on the tombstone? The beginning, because he wrote that. And the end, because he determined that in advance. The smallest part, however, the most important part is the dash. My question to you today is, what is your dash going to say? Is your dash going to say, well, they could have been great, but they were so scared of everything. They, they could have accomplished something great, but they didn't want to lose anything. They could have accomplished something great, but they didn't want to be hurt. And so they stuck back. Uh, what is your dash going to say? Say audacious faith. No, no, no. Life will try to wear you out. Do I got four or five of y'all that know what I'm about? It will try to wear you out in order to steal your audacious faith. But you've got to be like Jesus. Gee, the Bible says that he endured the cross and he despised the shame. You've got to be like Caleb. I didn't been through a lot, but you're going to give me my mountain. Uh, you can talk about me if you want to, but you're going to give me my mountain. Jesus said, say what you want to say, but in three days I'm going to be back and I'm going to give the keys of the kingdom to my saints and the saints of the Most High shall possess the kingdom. Watch this. He, he says, he, he says, uh, life is going to do everything it can to depress you. It's going to do everything it can to make you not trust anybody. It's going to do everything it can to make you look at people with a crooked eye. Life, I'm not talking to anybody. Life will do crazy things to you. Life will have you calling yourself a loving person, but the truth is you're mad as Gehenna. That's Greek for hell. First Sunday. Life will try to rob you of your faith. To be told, everything around us tries to rob us of our faith. Have you watched the news lately? The news is nothing but a faith robbing half hour. They started off robbing your faith. The jobs report. <laughs> Ain't nothing good on the news. I, and I thank Adele and Mike and all the rest of them. But they, yeah, yeah, it's just faith robbing. Local man shot. In other news, taxes going up. In other news, this is going wrong. Let's look at the weather, Kathy. <laughs> and then if you're like me and you don't like the snow, that's depressing too. Oh, God. I, you all done robbed all of my face sitting up here talking about we need the moisture. No, we don't. Get some water. <laughs> need no moisture. Let it rain. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? Life will try to wear you out. And through those processes where you're getting worn out, God is asking you a question because remember it's a story and every good story has a question and an answer. God's question to you is how bad do you want it? How desperate are you for a better life? How passionate are you to see things manifested in your life? He's asking you a question throughout the story. Now watch this. The only way we obtain that, the only way we obtain life and abundant life is through what? Faith. The Bible says that's how we live. Now, live means breathe. Got it? So, so in, other, in essence, God is saying, if you're not living by faith, you're not living. Bishop, what is faith? Stretch. If you're real comfortable in your life right now, can I make an announcement to you? You have a mundane and mediocre Christianity. Because faith will always cause you to get uncomfortable. Faith will always stretch you. Matter of fact, you know you're really walking with Jesus when you walk around and you got stretch marks. I'm talking about spiritual stretch marks. You walk around and you just stretched all up. God will always cause you to stretch to a higher place than what you can see. The moment you get comfortable, he's going to say, let's do something else. The moment you think to yourself, whoo, everything is finally over. The storm is over. He says, wait a minute, Katrina on the way. The moment you think everything is finally settling down, everything is finally getting the way I want it to be, I'm finally making some headway in my finances, I'm finally doing this, God says, good, time for another chapter in the story. Time for some stretching. Touch your neighbor, say stretching. Now watch this. Faith is supposed to grow and not stay stagnant. Now remember, you're given the measure of faith, but it's your responsibility to grow it. You hear what I'm saying? If you're trying to survive and make it, you're not living by faith. Which means then, since without faith it's impossible to please God, if you're not pleasing God, if you're just trying to survive. Touch your neighbor and say, stop trying to survive. Have you ever noticed that doesn't even work? Anyway, you say, Whoo, I'm just trying to make it to the end of the month. How, how's that working out? Faith was never designed for you to survive. It was designed for you to thrive. Touch your neighbor and say, audacious faith. Say it again, audacious faith. Uh, watch this. The scriptures are full of people. We looked at two today that have audacious faith. They would not be denied. So the question is, Bishop, then what is Audacious faith. You ready? It's a real simple message today. Audacious means fearless. Now, a lot of people associate audacity with arrogance, and that's a miscalculated assumption. Audacity or audacious means fearless. Watch this. It means daring. It means bold. See, this is God kind of stuff. See, I, I, maybe you were painting a picture of Jesus where he was just some little old weird guy that was walking around hugging trees, eating granola, and this kind of thing. And we thank God for trees, and we love granola. But that's not the kind of Jesus we serve. The kind of Jesus we serve would walk on the scene. He was a bold man. He was a man's man. Jesus would say, wait a minute. No, that's not going down like that. This isn't happening like that. The kind of Jesus we serve was a bold and daring and fearless man. What man do you know walks in another man's church and tells all the people you're going to hell? That's what he did. Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is preaching a message. You've seen me do this at least four or five times, but I love doing it because I love Jesus. And Jesus, in the middle of his message, he's got scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, self-righteous and religious separatists that didn't want other people to have access to their God. you got to watch out for folks like that that say, well, my God is in this little box, and if you don't do it in this little box, I'm here to tell you God is bigger than your box. And Jesus, in the middle of his message, he says, hey, y'all stand up back there. And they're thinking, oh, we're going to get recognized because we're sad, you see. And he sees how sad we are. We're, we're separatists. We, we are self-righteous people. And Jesus says, hey, all of you, woe unto you. Now they're thinking, uh-oh, probably shouldn't have stood up for this one. He says, not only woe unto you, he goes another further. Touch somebody to say another further. He goes another further. He says, you go all of this way to get one proselyte or one convert to the faith. He says, and then they see how you live, and you make them worse than sons of hell. 
He says, you brood of vipers, be seated. Now, as I was preaching, that's, that's the kind of God we serve. He was bold. Fellas, we would have loved Jesus because Jesus didn't do this gray thing. Jesus was black or white, left or right, up or down, out or cold. You walk around Jesus, he's just going to tell you like it is. Jesus, you like that dress? No. Not even a little bit. Somebody shout Jesus. That, that's the kind of God you serve. A bold, fearless, daring leader. Watch this. It means he gives no regards to restraints imposed by others. That's audacious. That's the kind of God we serve. And since uh, WWJD won't be like Jesus, then you got to be bold. You got to be audacious. Which means sometimes God's going to require you to do big things that make you totally uncomfortable. But you got to be bold, got to be daring, got to be fearless, and you can't give regard to restraints imposed by the bishop. What do you mean? Somebody says to you, I'm starting that business. They say, well, for what? Why are you doing that? You don't have enough education for that. You know, everybody in this family that tried to start a business and never worked. Why are you trying to do something? You got to look at them and say, hey, woe unto you. Get Wednesday's tape. I condemn those works. And if nobody else in this family has successfully built a business, watch me be the first. Get a little Davidic on them. Selah. Are you still here? Now, faith, 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 faith. Sometimes, sometimes saints make faith really, really, really deep. <laughs> I got faith. Somebody they got faith and they look constipated. <sighs> faith. Feel it. Can I tell you, 99% of the time, you ain't going to feel faith, and you're going to have to walk in faith. If you're waiting for some big vision to come, and, and I call you up in front of the whole church and tell you everything you're supposed to do in your life, don't hold your breath. Because many times, that's not how he does it. Many times, many times, you're going to have to walk in faith, and you don't feel not a lick of it. I mean, not even a little bit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Faith, then, are actions based on convictions from God. Now, I, I got to be clear here, Denver, because faith is not getting up on a mountain and standing up there and saying, well, I got faith that if I jump over this bad boy, Jesus is going to get me. That's not faith. That's crazy. Bishop, what's the difference? Faith is not just some thought I come up with. Faith is based on a conviction from God, which means God gives me an instruction, and based on that instruction, I receive conviction. I then act on that conviction with audacity, fearless, daring, not giving regard to the restraints imposed by others. Are you getting what I'm saying? Got it. All right. All right. All right. So, so we have to have what kind of faith? Audacious faith. Now, watch this. Our lives should not be mundane. But days where we make history every day. A lot of people get discouraged in their walk with God because it becomes mundane. And it only becomes mundane because they become scared. Every day you should be making history. Now, some of you may think, well, but Bishop, I can't preach. I can't sing. I can't do anything. You mean to tell me those are the only things you can do to make history? Do you not know that if you were a stay-at-home mom, you can be the best stay-at-home mom and utilize your faith and grow up some great generals? I wonder how Joshua's mom felt. I wonder how Moses' mama felt when she looked back and said, uh-uh, that's my boy there. I raised him. He got all of y'all in check. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't think that faith or doing great things just means that you're in front of a lot of people. Sometimes the greatest accomplishments are ones that nobody knows anything about. Sometimes, Father, you need to hear me when you're spending time with your son and you're imparting it to them. God says, that's audacious faith right there because you didn't see that and didn't have that done for you. So, so, ah, so since you're doing that for another, that's audacious. It's audacious faith. You're making history because while you may not be the history maker, God may trust you to influence the history maker. 
while your name may not get called, their name may get called. And God says you get credit for everything that they accomplish. I, am I talking to anybody? in the place. Don't you think just because it's not you who's got your name in the spotlight. Truth be told, once you get in the spotlight, can I tell you, you don't even want it. You can't go to Wendy's without having some stuff go on. You, you go to Popeye's and it's on Twitter. <laughs> Say audacious faith. Which means this, we should live not at our own comfortable speed. Which for most of us, if we're honest, is slow. It takes you 45 days to do something that you know you're supposed to do 400 days ago. You still praying, God, if that's you, flick the lights off, and I know this. God, if that's you, let it rain, let it rain all night in the middle of December. And 27 degree weather. If that's you, that's how I know. And God is saying, I don't have to do all that. So what ends up happening is because we operate with such doubt, we, we, don't, we don't operate fearless and, and daring and bold and without regard for the restraints imposed by others. And so what happens is, is your life can sometimes become mundane. But we shouldn't live at our own comfortable speeds. We should live at the speed of God. Say, Bishop, what is God's speed? Very good question. It means suddenly. That, that, that's the speed of God. God. God's speed is on Monday, I may be going this direction, but by Tuesday, I want to change and go this way. And you're going to have to be in a flow with me not to get so stuck to what I said that you miss what I'm saying. Sometimes folk can get so fixed on what God has said that they miss what he's saying. Suppose Abraham, when he took Isaac up the side of the mountain, got so fixated on the fact of what God had said, he didn't stop to listen when God said, wait a minute, there's a ram in the thicket for you, and you don't have to kill your son. The speed of God is suddenly, in Acts chapter 2, it was suddenly. The Bible says they were all gathered together with one accord. And what? Suddenly, uh, cloven tongues fell upon them. Joshua and the sun standing still. Joshua says, God, you've given me a promise that we were supposed to defeat all of our enemies. And it's getting dark. And if it gets dark, some of them are going to escape. Which means, God, what I need you to do for me right now is don't let that sun move. And the Bible says there was never a day like it before or like a day after where God said, I have healed the voice of a man and God says in this one day I'm gonna make it 24 hours of additional sun night and the sun will stand still for you God specializes in the speed call suddenly somebody shout suddenly the woman with the issue of blood 12 years she's got her issue and after one seemingly inconsequential touch of the garments of a man, and you know the garments were dirty. They walked on dirt roads with sandals, my Jesus. And they didn't have Irish Spring. Come on, let's just get real. They didn't have Old Spice. It's a spice. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And this woman, the Bible says, presses through a crowd of people that are trying to give to Jesus. But because she operated with audacious faith, she didn't care what nobody around her thought. She wasn't trying to look good for nobody around her. She said, I'm going to go for what I know, and I've got enough faith to know if I can get to Jesus. I've never done this before. I've, I've never experienced this before. But i got enough faith to know if I get to Jesus. And the Bible says, immediately, a 12-year problem is fixed. No, I need you to get it. Good, get it. Take your pen out your hand, and I want you to snap your finger one time. Get your pen out your hand, snap your finger. That quick, a 12-year issue that nobody else can seem to figure out. See, you got some stuff you're dealing with in your life that nobody else has been able to figure out. You've done 10 steps to this, 4 steps to this, 8 steps to this, ain't none of that work. Let's do it. That quick. You're thinking it's going to take 10 years for God to do it. God says, all I need is some audacious faith and that quick. I wish somebody had some faith in this house today. God says, suddenly, immediately, that quick. 
suddenlies occur when faith meets opportunity. Jesus wasn't coming back that way. And if she wouldn't have laid down her pride and laid down her arrogance and laid down her own logic and her own thought, she would have missed him. And you know what would have happened? She would have died with her issue. How many saints have died with their issues because they were too prideful to have audacious faith? How many people died with their issues because they were too arrogant to have audacious faith? How many people died with their issues because they were scared to, uh, scared to take a step of faith? I, I remember, I remember I was coming up, uh, there, there's this drum machine, you know, and this is the different drum machines, not the new ones, where you push a button and it plays something. This is the old drum machine where it had little pads. And, uh, and so they said, uh, they said, come on, man, come on, come on, play the drum machine. I want to play the drum, but all these people's around me watching. Now, this is simple, but this is what your neighbor does. All these people were watching. He said, man, you play it, I'll give it to you. That's a good deal. You can't beat free. <laughs> and I stood there, and I mean, at this point, I'm sweating because truth be told, while, while I'm bold and daring and fearless for the Lord, in that particular instance, I was shy. <laughs> and I was scared that my drum beat wasn't going to sound as good as somebody else's drum beat. Y'all ain't saying nothing. I was scared I was going to get showed up. And if you don't want to think about Bishop, Bishop don't like to lose. And so I only get in fights. I already know I'm going to win. I, I never engage in something that I don't know I'm already going to win. That's why I fight the good fight of faith. That, that means I know I'm going to win before I get in the ring. I don't have Don King fixing my fights. I got Jesus Christ, the King, fixing my fights. So, but in this particular instance, I know all that. So play the drum machine. I get the drum machine. And I, I was scared. I was scared. I was scared. I, and, and, so, and so I sat right there. Could have got a free drum machine. But because I was so concerned about the people around me, I didn't play it. And you know what they said? Man, you could have had a free drum machine. And, and you know what I did trying to, try, trying to you know, you, you people don't know. Whether, well, you know, I, I didn't need it. <laughs> Two feet tall, I wanted that thing so bad. There's, there's one problem. Such a neighbor say one problem. There's one problem with the Bible. Bishop, what are you talking about problem with the Bible? Ain't no problem with the Bible. Oh, yes, there is. There's a problem. Bishop, what's the problem? God only put the important details in the Bible. I'm going to help your neighbor. Which means while you see the woman with the issue of blood, a 12-year process is summed up in five verses. And her journey isn't chronicled in the text. You can't tell me for 12 years all you had was five verses. And the Bible says she spent everything. So think of all the stuff she had to go through. Well, but, uh, th think of all the, the payday loans she had to get while she was up. Uh, think of all of the people that said she was crazy and she was stupid for continuing to go to church and serve God and she still got her issue. Think of all the stuff she had to The Bible doesn't say that part. It doesn't say that part. In essence, say why, Bishop? In essence, God was saying, when you look back at all the stuff you had to deal with in your journey, you're going to look back at that stuff, and you know what you're going to say? That wasn't nothing. I, 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 it wasn't even that bad. Here's what you're going to say when you look back at that stuff. That ain't even important no more. What did they even do to me? I forgot how they hurt me. I don't even remember that. In essence, what God was saying is it will not record what happened to her in her journey of faith. Because when she looked back on it, none of that is even important. Will y'all help me preach for this last 15 seconds? That's why Romans 8 and 18 says, I consider... That our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Which means I'm going to have to go through some stuff, some hell, some high water, some haters. But when I look back, I wish I had some folk that take a look back down. 
memory lane. Is there anybody in the house that can say, I can look back down memory lane and I look at that stuff and it ain't even that important no more? There's, there's one problem with the Bible. It doesn't chronicle her journey. Because God said, that's not even important to me. I wonder how many relationships she lost because they didn't understand the proclivity of her issue. I wonder how many men walked up to her and said, baby, I love you. Till they found out she had an issue. And said, well, love don't live here no more. So you ought to treasure the people that love you and know all your junk. Because see, the people that love you and know all your junk, th those are rare treasures because most people don't have the ability to love you and know what's wrong with you at the same time. Some people, the moment they find out what's wrong with you, they're out. They're, they're caught. But you better treasure. If God gives you a pastor, if God gives you a friend, if God gives you somebody that can know your junk and still love you, you better treasure that. How many times has she had to get second mortgages and refinance the last mortgage to get a new mortgage and then refinance the other one because the equity went up, but then they hit a recession back in Jerusalem and so now the equity down and the house ain't worth what it was no more. And now they, I wonder how much she had to go through that the Bible never tells us about. See, some of you are sitting here today and you said, but Bishop, you, you don't know the story. You, 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 don't know the, you don't know the times I have to cry. Because there's so much I have no other emotional response. And, and men, I know we're tough and I know we're hard, but men, can we be honest that there, there are some things that even make us cry sometimes. And, and you're just saying, Woo, God, I, I don't know. And you don't ever let nobody see you cry. You wait till you're by yourself. And like a little puffer, you begin to lick and to tend to your wounds. Ladies, am I talking to anybody? I, sometimes women will break down and cry. I don't know why they cry. They just cry. They just cry. Because the Bible doesn't chronicle the journey. He only put the important part in there. He said for 12 years she had some issues, and then she heard about Jesus. For, for, for 12 years she had some problems, and then she heard about Jesus. The, the Bible gets right to the point. For, 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 for over a decade she's had some problems, but then after one instance of hearing about Jesus, she audaciously gets on the floor. She's got to humble herself. She gets on the ground. It's dirty down there. But everybody else has already cast her off anyhow and said she's filthy and she's not worth anything because she had broken the Levitical law. She had broken the Torah because the Torah said if a woman has an issue of blood, she should be shut off from the people. And she was in there amongst the people, which means all of the people around her had already counted her out. So she said, what I got to lose from you, you can't do nothing for me anyhow. Stop giving people credence that don't matter. What's so-and-so going to think? They don't like you anyhow. What you studying that for? I ain't studying that. Touch, that's country. Let me tell you. Uh, studying means I'm not paying any attention to that. I, I'm sorry. I forgot I ain't in the country. Touch your neighbor and say, that's country. Uh, let me get very specific. That's a southern colloquialism. Let me just get you right where you're at. She gets on the ground. I'm through. And she's pressing. Her clothes are dirty. The flow is still there, so there's still blood. And everybody sees her. And you know what I found out about blood? Blood has an odor. So not only does everybody see her, but everybody smells her. Everybody smells her issue when she comes in. She couldn't even hide her stuff. I'm not talking to anybody. She, she couldn't even hide it from anybody because the song said it was written all over her face. She didn't have to say a word. And so... She's coming through. And as she's coming through, she gets close to the religious folk. And the religious folk looking at her like, what you doing here? You don't look like us. You ain't got a suit on like us. You don't shout like we do. You don't know when it's time to dance like we do. What you doing here? Aren't you glad for a church like Harvest where it's not a bunch of religious fakes and phonies sitting up. See, I shout over that because because I've been a lot of places around the country and I've been a lot of places around the world and I'm here to tell you this doesn't happen everywhere. They look down on her. 
Imagine how guilty she feels. Oh, because by the way, I taught this before. Can I tell you why she had the issue? Oh, because the Bible doesn't tell that part either. Uh, the Bible says that that issue was a particular curse when you violated sexual laws. Which means not only does she have an issue for 12 years, she caused it. You obviously didn't hear what I just said. See, the enemy wants you to think because you caused the issue that Jesus will pull you out of the issue. But I'm here to let somebody know if God be for you, who, who, who? She had the issue because she laid down with somebody and that became a curse. So not only did everybody see her bloody, smelly, full of shame, everybody knew what she did to get it. I'm talking to somebody today watching on the internet campus. Everybody knew. She gets up around the religious people, and they're looking at her. What is she doing here? Doesn't she know this is a crusade? Doesn't she know Jesus is busy? Jesus got plenty of folk need saving, plenty of folk need healing, plenty of people need touching. And she's coming up here talking about something. But at that moment, I see the tears running down her face. I see the thoughts in her mind. Maybe I'll just turn back. Maybe, maybe I'm supposed to die like this. Maybe, maybe this is just, this is what I get because I've been so bad. But then she says, no, I will not be denied. And if he said he's a healer, don't go that he's going to heal me. Tears are running down her face. She's getting close. But the people, the people, the people are looking at her. They're stepping on her. They're not paying any attention to her. She's in a crowd full of people, yet she's alone. And she finally sees. And the trip about it is she couldn't even see his face. And she touched the hem of his garment. Watch this. She didn't touch him. And he didn't touch her. She just touched something that was touching him. That's why being in church is so important. Because you may not get to his face. And he may not lay hands on you physically. But you can touch somebody or something that's touching him. And the Bible says when she grabbed the hem of his garment, coincidentally, let me just give you some facts that probably aren't consequential to the outcome of the story, but however, we'll give you some background information. Jesus was wearing a tallit, a prayer garment. And the scripture says healing would be in his wings. The ends of that prayer garment, the four ends are called the wings. She knew the story from Malachi that says healing would be in his wings. So she said, I got enough sense to know that if I can touch that, I will be made whole. She had audacious faith. Are there any people in harvest today? I said, are there any people in harvest today? I don't need everybody. I just need some of y'all. Are there any people at harvest today that'll say, I have audacious faith it's boring it takes too long it's not relevant to my everyday life i don't even get anything out of it oh you know you don't have to go to church to know god do you there are so many hypocrites there's nothing for my children <sighs> i was hurt in my last church it seems like all churches are the, the same. same stop all churches aren't the same and we want you to come see why Harvest Christian Center is a real, relevant, multicultural, multi-generational, spiritual church that's perfect for people that aren't, and we're in your city. At every worship service, you'll enjoy uplifting praise and worship, powerful and relevant teaching and preaching from our senior pastor, Bishop Foreman, passionate prayer, and so much more, with ministries for singles, men, women, kids, and students. There's something for your whole family at Harvest. Join us for a variety of weekly services and start experiencing God like never before while being equipped to love God, love people, and love life. 
Maybe you're just coming into Christianity, or maybe you're already a Christian that's looking to grow spiritually. Harvest is the place for you. Visit our website at harvestcc.me or call us toll free at 1-877-552-4746. Don't wait. You're not watching this by accident. Visit harvestcc.me or call us toll free at 1-877-55-BISHOP. All churches aren't the same. Join us at Harvest Christian Center to come see why. Can't attend in person? You can enjoy Harvest Live and on demand 24-7 on our worldwide internet campus today.